if you don't want to believe in God, or if you don't believe in God, you've got to come up with a natural explanation for why you're sitting here now. And if you're convinced that a single cell became you, that macro, macro evolution process, if you already believe that, then it's kind of easy to think getting from just chemistry to that single cell. That's just, that's just a little leap compared to getting to you. And we've already bought this, so this is no big deal. Right. And they need that again in order to have rational underpinning of what they believe. And so they will do whatever they can to defend that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Creation.Live. I'm your host, Trey. In each episode of this show, ICR scientists gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be ICR's current research, something new that's come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that ultimately impacts how science points to our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. I have with me today, my co-host, Lauren. Hello. And I have with me Dr. Stadler. Thank you for being here. Hello, thanks for having me. And Dr. Tompkins, our scientist and geneticist. Thank you, Dr. Tompkins, for being here. Thank you, it's great to be here. Well, uh, we're speaking about um, the rise of life. Uh, where did life come from? I know that this is a topic that uh, is kind of bounced around in different circles. Um, some people say aliens brought it here. You know, there's all sorts of ideas. Uh, but today we're speaking about like abiogenesis, the idea that life can come from non-life. And before we get into it, as our special guest, uh, Dr. Stadler, can you uh, give our listeners and viewers kind of a very brief summary of, of why you're geared and equipped to talk about this? I'm a scientist. I'm, I've worked as a scientist for 26 years in medical devices um, so medicine is a passion, and I've always been just thrilled with how life works, how the body works, and what, as engineers or scientists, we can do to help people that are having medical conditions. Um, so I have a PhD in medical engineering, and I've been putting that to practice for 26 years. Awesome. And we all know Dr. Tompkins is our geneticist, is very well equipped to speak on this. Uh, we don't need to do an introduction for you, Dr. Tompkins, <laughs> as I think about it. We've, we've done that. Uh, so abiogenesis is not a new thing. Uh, the idea that life can come from non-life. Uh, in some of my preliminary readings about this, uh, you know, Aristotle thought that flies came from rotting meat. Uh, just out of nowhere. Uh, and then it looks like there's actually like, there's been like this give and take of where someone will say this happens and then someone will do an experiment that kind of shows that that's wrong. And yet still uh, the idea of abiogenesis has kind of persisted uh, through all these years. Um, I know that uh, one of our uh heroes of creationism, uh, Louis Pasteur did his famous experiment that showed that, you know, if, if you stop up the, the beaker, then it, life cannot grow out of nothing. It cannot come out of thin air. But yet, uh, from my understanding, the theory of evolution kind of requires this to happen for anything to happen. Uh, so, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'll lean on y'all for that. So let's, uh, let's chat a little bit about um, why abiogenesis is kind of a linchpin to, we'll say, evolutionary thought. I, I see it as somewhat separate from evolution in a way that evolution is teaching how uh, we all have common ancestor is what <laughs> it's teaching. And so a single cell became you right. through the process. Um, but getting to that first single cell, life from non-life, a lot of people consider that different or distinct because I mean, they might call it chemical evolution, mm. which is chemicals evolving rather than living things evolving. So some people like to keep those separate. The thing that pulls them together, I believe, is that in order to be an atheist and claim that you're a rational thinker, in other words, you, you, you think there's no God or you don't believe there's a God, if you're going to rationally believe that, you need to find a totally natural way 
to get from non-life to life. You have to explain that leap somehow. Otherwise, you're believing in something that doesn't, no one can accept. It's not rational. Mm-hmm. Right. That's kind of the linchpin of it, is you have to find a way to get to life naturally if you're going to con- claim you're a rational atheist. Okay. Dr. Chompkins, any thoughts on that? No, exactly. You know, for evolution to even be plausible, I mean, you have to have some way for it to come about from non-life. And really, it, the, ultimately, it's, it's probably the worst problem for biological evolution is, you know, where did first life come from? Where did the original biomolecules come from? How did they self-assemble into a cell? Um, and all of it is, is totally problematic. The, the entire paradigm of, of abiogenesis is really utterly problematic from every angle you look at it. Okay. Well, and as, as believers, we, of course, you know, we have a start to life. Uh, scripture states that, you know, God made life and, and put it here on earth uh, as a very uh, intentional thing, not a random chemical, I don't want to call it explosion, but reaction, I guess, uh, that caused life to occur. I was just wondering if they had come up with any reasonable well, we know it's not reasonable, but what is like the best argument that the other side has for abiogenesis? What do they say maybe the elements were that came together? What is their explanation? Because obviously there are a lot of intelligent people that hold to this, even though it's false. And so there's got to be something that they say, this is why we believe in this. What is their best argument? I would love for either of y'all to answer that. Well, the one you find in every biology textbook is this Miller-Urey experiment. Famous, I guess. They start with some very basic molecules like carbon dioxide and water and ammonia and methane, and they put it in a vial and bubble it up and have some electrical discharge. And over a couple of days, there's a lot of gunk in there. And amongst the gunk, yes, in fact, they can find amino acids, which are essential in living things. Right. And that's all in the textbooks, and it's, it's there to give you some encouragement, some hint that it's possible. Right. And a lot of people overinterpret that. The media makes a big hype about this that uh, you know, it's one step away from life if they just left it plugged in a little longer. Right. <laughs> you would have had life. <laughs> but the more we know about what is required for life, even the simplest, simplest living thing, and the more we understand about physics and chemistry and thermodynamics, um, we see this growing incredible gulf between uh, just single amino acids like Miller and Urate provided and what's required to, to get life. Well, because amino acids, like you said, are necessary for life. But that's not life. You can take them in capsule format. They're not... It's kind of like saying that uh, we found sand, and therefore microprocessors should come out of a (laughs) natural process. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Historically, since this has been kind of an idea that has existed for many centuries, again, not a new thing, um, why did people in the past believe it and... or? In your opinion, uh, you may not be able to go and ask them, uh, but why historically have like Aristotle and other scientists believe that life kind of came from nowhere? And then also, why do they believe it today? It's like, and you said, it's hard to know what people were thinking in the past, right. but basically, of course, there's a lot of ignorance, you might say, or just a lack of understanding of science. And so they could see animals being born, humans or cows, whatever, being born. So they know that was one way that life came from life. But just knowing that that's typically what you see doesn't exclude the possibility that life could just pop into existence. Mm-hmm. So, and so people, maybe they were more mystical back then, I don't know, but they did believe even like mice, even lions, I think, in one case, could just pop into existence. That's a little terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live in that world. And, <laughs> and, you know, in the world of science, it's very difficult to prove something never could possibly have mm-hmm. happened. Right. Because even though you've never observed it, maybe. Maybe somewhere. And I imagine, like, the molecular side of things, smaller, like insects and things like that, it would be, kind of, you don't see that happening. You know, you don't see them being born unless... You're paying yeah. a very close attention, you know. Uh, Dr. Tompkins, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, it, early on, you know, it, it was difficult to observe, you know, bacteria basically um, propagating in a solution. 
you, you can't see it with the visible eyes. A lot of times, you know, with the spontaneous generation and insects coming from a piece of meat, um, you know, that, although you can't observe it, if you just sit there <laughs> and watch that piece of meat and don't ever take your eyes off it for for a day or two. Um, but, but things like that, you know, kind of would happen and, and no one would actually observe the process that was causing that to happen, which is a biological uh, process. So, so people back then thought, oh, well, just stuff life comes from non-life and look at this and look at that and but when they began to actually you know apply scientific methods to to seeing how those things came about they realized that no it, it was not spontaneous generation that when you when you create sterile conditions things cannot spontaneously generate it's interesting to me because interacting a lot with people that follow our ministry both people that agree with us and naysayers who strongly disagree with us we see a lot, I see a lot, the term magic used to accuse us of thinking that something magical happened. And people get very creative with how they express themselves. It's often extremely disrespectful to our God. But it's just interesting to me that they are accusing us of blaming magic for the beginning of life or the universe even. And yet what you were describing with throwing a bunch of things together and putting electricity in there, and they always want the evidence. Like, where's the evidence? you got to show us the evidence that God created everything. And yet... They have none. They don't have repeatable experiments that prove, that are able to replicate the beginning of life. That's just very interesting to me. So in light of all that, because obviously, like you said, people might have been, or one of you said, people might have been more mystical in the past. Today, that's not really a good excuse because we have all these studies. We have repeatable experiments that we can perform. Why do you think people today still continue to cling to this idea of abiogenesis? What about what do you think, Doctor Sadler? Well, it's hard to psychoanalyze people and, and to guess at that. But go if, ahead and give it, it a shot. Give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it goes back to if you don't want to believe in God, or if you don't believe in God, you've got to come up with a natural explanation for why you're sitting here now. And if you're convinced that a single cell became you, that macro macro evolution process, if you already believe that then it's kind of easy to think getting from just chemistry to that single cell. That's just, that's just a little leap compared to getting to you. And we've already bought this, so, so this is no big deal. Right. And they need that again in order to have rational underpinning of what they believe. And so they will do whatever they can to defend that. And I think this abiogenesis we've been talking about from times of Aristotle until now is a series of retreat and regression. So used to think, oh, lions? No, maybe, maybe mice? No, maybe insects? No, that's been disproved. How about microscopic little mini life? And now it has retreated to what is believed today is once, billions of years ago, just by chance occurrence, one little cell came about. And that, that's what it's retreated to. And that's kind of the ultimate stronghold of, of this group that's going to defend that for all they're worth, because that is their worldview. Okay. Just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. <laughs> you can't like you said, that's hard, right to, yeah, that's hard to prove. You're right. Okay. So what wow. do you think, let's, let's kind of analyze that a little bit. What are some obstacles? And I know you've studied this subject extensively and even written a book about it, and we can talk about that here in a minute. But what are some of the obstacles that life would have to cross over to pass in order to just spontaneously appear, any kind of life, from the small to the large? Yeah, that's a lengthy question. I could go on for hours on that one. Go for it. Just, We'd love to hear it, yes. <laughs> so I like to look at it as a, a, a top-down approach, which means take life today. How simple could it possibly get and still be the bar of alive? And also a bottom-up approach of taking basic chemicals. How do they mix and mingle? And what can we get them to do? So they got to get up to that bar, right? Um, and... For clarification, uh, what do we mean when we refer to life? Because we know amino acids are That's not life. Definition. Yeah, like yeah. what 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 would you consider like the basic? And it's not basic because we know that it's very complex. But like, how far down is the most basic form of life? Yeah, great question. And I don't think science has the the ultimate answer. Okay, <laughs> but where you get to a point where people would never argue about would be. You know, bacteria is very, so we have eukaryotes, which we are, and that can get more simple down to prokaryotes, which are single-celled microorganisms like bacteria. 
And then among those, there's really simple kinds like mycoplasma, which is maybe a tenth as complicated as E. coli. E. coli is bacteria we're kind of familiar with. We have some in, <laughs> in the gut. So yeah. mycoplasma like may be, <laughs> maybe 10% as complicated as a bacteria, something like that. Um, that's about as low as I think we can go and, and still all agree that it's life. Mm -hmm. Now, people might argue about viruses and so forth, but they can't replicate on their own. They have no metabolism on their own. So I don't think of them as alive, but that's debatable and people... What do you think, Dr. Tompkins? You know, for a basic cell, you need DNA, RNA, proteins, but you need more than that. You need uh, complex carbohydrates and, and, and lipids. And all of these different materials have to come together, and many of them have to be polymerized or put together by highly specialized machinery. So amino acids just don't magically come together to form proteins. They have to be polymerized by, by polymerases. What is that? Polymer. Uh, polymerizing is actually making a chain uh, of individual units. So, so with amino acids, um, they form peptides and proteins. And of course, nucleic acids form DNA and RNA. But to actually get the connection between the different amino acids or the different nucleotides, you have to have very specialized complex cellular machinery to cause that to happen. It just doesn't magically happen on its own. And then you've got the whole issue of information because a DNA molecule or a protein molecule or an RNA uh, is actually a string of, of individual units based on information needed to create something useful. So, so you have this whole concept of information, you know, laid over this system. You have all this complex machinery that needs to really put stuff together. And, you know, just to get a few amino acids in some process, um, like the Miller-Urey experiment is, is not enough. And, and actually that whole experiment had a lot of problems in and of itself too, mm -hmm. because your body uses left-handed amino acids. And so in the Miller-Urey experiment, it was producing this mix of both right and left-handed amino acids. So molecules are kind of like your hands in a sense, small molecules, they can be left-handed or right-handed. Mm. And your body only uses left-handed amino acids. Then on top of that, the entire experiment was an engineered concoction to begin with. Humans engineered the experiment, and they actually had to put a trap into the, into the system to collect this goo that was created from the reaction because the, the material that was created in the Miller-Urey experiment would have been destroyed as fast as it was created. So they had to create this little trap and then pull the material out of that trap. And so the whole thing was totally engineered and concocted by yeah. by an intelligent human so yeah but yeah you see that in textbooks and it's like no this is this is utter nonsense you know at, at every angle you look at at that experiment there's there's major problems so it really doesn't explain life well whatsoever. if anything it, it really indicates that life couldn't have happened exactly. by chance yeah. because if they if it was that carefully engineered with all of the right situations and the right circumstances for life to hopefully appear and it still didn't how could it just coincidentally have done it at some point so if anything right. that experiment really kind of messed them up a little bit yeah. <laughs> well even my you know even humans now we can't engineer life yeah you know um craig venter was a famous scientist who supposedly created the first artificial cell but he actually is all he did was use uh, materials that already existed out there in the the biological world and information that already existed out there in the biological world that that you know, God created all of that. So Craig Venter just took pieces of God's creation and, and put them together to to create his artificial cell. So he didn't really create life from non-life. Mm. And so he, he humans, we still can't do it. You know, even with all the the amazing uh, genomic and DNA technology that we have, we still can't create life on our own. You know, we have to use what's already out there to to do something. Built it, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, I think the more we learn about physics and chemistry and thermodynamics, and the more we learn about life and what life requires, even the simplest, simplest forms of life, we see this growing gulf between what chemicals on their own can do and what, what life would require to get started. Mm -hmm. And he brought up many great examples of that. But as, as we learn more about life and about chemistry, we find that what natural processes do is the opposite of what is required for life. 
Uh, so you brought up a great example of the, the chirality that amino acids and nucleotides and even phospholipids that make up the cell membrane, they come in chiral forms, a right hand or a left hand. Any chemical reaction you do in a beaker in a lab, natural processes, will make a 50-50 mixture every time. It's just a natural, we know that, that's what nature does, 50-50 mixture. So you would think if life came out of a natural process, your body would contain 50-50, cause that's mm -hmm. what, that, we know that. Mm. But nope, it's 100% one and 0% the other. And it's not just amino acids, right? It's, it's the nucleotides and the phospholipids are all very sensitive to chirality. And then when you try to bring those individual components together to make a polymer, so like a string of, uh, Long string, mm -hmm. like a like it's a very good visual yeah. representation, <laughs> or yeah. like uh, box cars on a train track, yeah. perfectly yeah. lined up, perfectly That's lined good. up. Yeah. Natural processes do not line things up perfectly like that. You end up with a hodgepodge of stuff that is stuck on in, in yeah. various ways. That's what natural processes do. But in life, you get it perfectly, perfectly lined up. Um, and and there are dozens of examples like that where we know what natural processes do, and life is is very distinct in a different way. It's like expecting a tornado to go through a construction yard and then it leaves a house in its wake. <laughs> uh, yeah, wow. Well. And the way that the believers of abiogenesis try to get through that argument is to say that there is replication, self-replication of these information-containing molecules like RNA. Uh, and then there can be a chemical evolution process, meaning slight mistakes happen in the replication and somehow the better ones are favored. Well, where did the first ones come from? That's the thing. So <laughs> no one has ever seen a, a self-replicating information type molecule. Uh, even the latest papers out there, you can read them and they have bold claims. The title is always a bold claim because they get that published. But when you read the paper, you find they are nowhere close to getting something that can replicate itself meaning that the whole process that they hypothesize of getting to life is, has the rug pulled out from under it because they can't get it started. Are there still attempts going on today to basically engineer this process, or did they just kind of give up and start putting it in the textbooks as fact like they kind of did with evolution? <laughs> well, what's done today is that they'll pick out one item of this, like how do I get a nucleotide from purely natural processes? And they'll try lots of things, a lot of human intelligence and engineering, you might say, built into the process. And they'll find just the right conditions, the right kind of solution, the right pH, the right temperatures, and they'll produce a whole bunch of different molecules in there, like a million types of things. But with very sensitive equipment, they find that, they find that one that they were looking for. I did it. I did it. <laughs> and then they'll write the paper up and claim success, and it's a big deal. And they don't mention the limitations, the struggle it takes, and... and how much effort and money went into it. Yeah, and what's really unfortunate then is that the media comes in and they hype it up even further than that. Hey, we've solved the origin of life. We've solved this problem and all that stuff. And each one of those is in a vacuum of accomplishment here. And then somebody else does a little accomplishment here. They made amino acids. Uh, and they're completely different conditions and there's no, no congruence to it, but, but they portray it that way. And so mm -hmm. people end up believing it's possible. Wow. So you co-authored a book, uh, Stairway to Life, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, we'll link to it in the description for anyone interested. Um, and you should be interested. Uh, let's, let's chat a little bit about that. Uh, what, is, what do you mean when you are calling it a stairway to life? That's, that's kind of a, a convenient way to write a book because it, it walks people through one step at a time that uh, if you wanted to get from basic chemicals to a living thing, you'd need this, and you need this, and you need this, and a convenient kind of stairway to organize a book. Okay. But in practice, uh, there's the risk, and I knew in writing it, there's the risk that that makes it seem easy. I can take a step, I can take a step. You know, I can walk a mile that way. Uh, when in reality, it's more of a cliff <laughs> because you would need all of those steps to come together at the same time. And Jeff alluded to this, that... Life doesn't just need proteins and DNA and RNA, but it needs them all at the same time, mm -hmm. all in, an, in a, a, a membrane 
that provides homeostasis. In other words, it, it keeps the inside the same, even though the outside is changing the environment, the inside is the same. Uh, and you need all these things because you can't get proteins without DNA and RNA, and you can't get DNA without proteins. Uh, they're, all inter they're all interdependent. So you got to have all this. It's more of a cliff than a staircase. But the and staircase each, each step is a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> each step is a cliff too. Yeah. yeah wow. Um, can so uh, we don't want to give the whole book away, but can we chat through a, a couple of those? Maybe the the first couple of of steps that life would need to overcome. Maybe not in a super scientific way, but just kind of generally speaking. And we've talked through a few of them already, like getting getting the I'm, I'm homo chiral the homo chirality is <laughs> yeah. a problem and getting the polymerization to line up just perfectly okay. like that. Getting molecules that can replicate themselves is a requirement. Something that's very un unappreciated in this field is the essential need for um, repair processes. Mm. And recycling and removing junk. So, so it's easy to think of a whole animal as producing mm. waste. I mean, right. Everybody produces waste. But a single cell uh, is also producing waste. And it, and it also produces broken machinery sometimes. You know, like a ribosome used to make protein can break. The machine, machinery is broken. Or sometimes it can get clogged up. It's kind of like a ribosome constipation situation. <laughs> now, that would kill the cell. Yeah. Mm. So something's got to come in there and say, I identify there's a problem. I'm going to label these molecules for recycling, like put a sticker on it. Literally, it's doing that, putting a sticker on to say, you're out, you're out, you're out. And then something else has to come along and eat the labeled bad molecule. Eat it, meaning break it back down to component parts so it's recycled and used again, or expel it from the cell. And if you don't do this, you're going to die. So you think of how specific that process has to be to label, to notice something's wrong, label it, and then destroy it. And if that process wasn't right, it was, it's going to go destroy good stuff, right? If it's mislabeling things, it's just going to eat itself up. And It's almost like an entire city process in itself. Mm -hmm. Like, it, I think it's like trash day or whatever, right. you know? Yeah. It comes and it gets rid of it. And if you didn't, your house would be a mess if trash never And you can out. just see the, the intelligence in it. Even, yeah. you know, DNA, you can get one bad base, one bad base in DNA out of a million base pairs, one bad base. Something is able to recognize, oh, there's a problem there. And it comes in and slices it out, slices it out, pull it out, put a nice one in, patch it up. That's, that's, and you must, must have that for any kind of life. I feel like that's part of the irony of um, the media getting so excited about these little tiny baby steps towards creating life. And I say that in quotes for those who are listening on audio. Um, but that's some of the irony of that because creating life, starting life, originating life is only one step in the process because then you got to be able to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. And if any of those components, like you said, if any of those components, even in the simplest organism, is not there immediately right then working together um, as a complete process, then immediately, as soon as you succeeded in creating life, it's gone again within one generation because all the necessary components are not in place. It has to all be there. Yeah. You've, you've used the term, Dr. Tompkins, before uh, a system of systems. I, I've heard you mention that. And, and, and as, as we discuss this, I'm just like, kind of blown away that like we can view something that is so very clearly complex and it is a part of some like the cell itself is so complex and these different types of cells gather together and they make an organ or a blood vessel or something else and those are complex even more so and all of those pieces come together to form a living a living creature and it's just complexity upon complexity upon complexity. Uh, where I don't even really know how to, to ask this question, but like the almost the audacity to think that it could uh, just happen out of nowhere. Where, where does that idea even like begin from? Like, where does that come from? Well, it, you know, it's based in your presuppositions. Is there a God? Is there a creator? Or do you want to repress that? Because the Bible says every human knows there is a God and a creator. 
they just flat out do. If if they claim to be an atheist, it's because they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And so they want a system that allows them to live a life of rebellion and sin uh, away from God. And so it doesn't matter how outrageous that system is, they concoct in their minds. It has um, to be. Right, exactly. It, it, it has to, There's no other way it's part of their presupposition to, to approaching uh, life. And, you know, I worked at, at a major university for a long time, and I talked to a lot of people, you know, graduate students and, and professors and really smart people. And the one thing that I found is that a lot of them just didn't want to think about it. Mm. So I'd say, well, let's talk about the origin of life and, and the problem. No, I don't want to talk about that. And so a lot of people just suppress the major issues and the problems because they they have a presuppositional you know philosophy that that they don't want to include that and they suppress that we've been talking a lot about the um the bottom up approach getting simple chemicals to be more complicated more complicated there's also the top down approach which is can you get simple life simpler 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 and a lot of people see that as a justification or an argument that we, we know life today, and we know it can get this simple, and they believe that there used to be much simpler life, proto-cells, proto-proto-cells, proto-DNA. That just doesn't stuff. exist anymore? It, what? <laughs> Conveniently, it doesn't uh, exist anymore. Uh, okay. More magic. But, right. but there's been a large body of work, and, and you mentioned Craig Venter's group who's done a great amount of work to try to take the simplest life and dumb it down. And throw out, you know, like a boat where you throw out anything so you don't see. Yeah. <laughs> They're throwing stuff out as much as they can to get it down, down, down as low as they can get. And what they have gotten down to so far, and it, this is the current world record, I guess, is it's a cell. They, it came from mycoplasma, but it's simplified. And it's called JVCI Sin 3A. I'm sure that's an obvious name. Yes, perfect. <laughs> My favorite. Very thing. catchy, yes. <laughs> but this thing is about 500,000 base pairs of DNA, half a million. So picture half a million letters in a book. Okay. Um, that's just the DNA. There's more information in there beyond what's in the DNA, but it's 493 genes. And, they, if, and, and that's all kind of essential. So if you throw out more stuff, it's not going to live. But it's not a simple question of living or not living, but as they dumb it down and try to make it simpler they get to a place where they have something that's barely alive, but only if you give it a coddled existence and you clean its diapers for it and, <laughs> and give it just the right food at just the right temperature, wow. it becomes really, really delicate to keep that thing alive. And that's where we're at now as they try to push it down. A very sickly life form. It, but it's alive. Yeah. <laughs> and, but that, that for me establishes this bar of 500,000 base pairs of DNA and 493 genes. How are you going to get up to, to cross that bar yeah. from natural processes. And it is a gap that is unimaginably large from where we, what we can do with chemicals and, and what simple life has. Okay, so just extrapolating that a little bit, we have this very coddled form of life that was created in a lab, uh, and that's the simplest form of life. It was, well, to say, it wasn't created in a lab. Oh, okay. It was dumbed down dumbed from down. existing life. Okay, dumbed, dumbed down from existing. Thank you. Uh, but it's still, it, according to evolutionary theory, which, as you said, is separate from the abiogenesis uh, issue a little bit. You know, they're, they're, they're separate. But that dumbed down, simplified piece of life that requires scientists to do everything for it, essentially. Keep it alive. To keep it alive is now may be expected to go back up evolutionarily speaking like i just don't see any logic in that that's true they they can dumb it down to the point where it, it doesn't have a future okay. <laughs> and that's that's where it's at but the whole point of that was to say what is the simplest life that okay. we can all agree is a living thing okay one thing that gets me is that even if you s solve theoretically where life came from and how it originally formed you're still left with the problem of where did those chemicals come from or whatever the precursors were to chemicals. And I just always think, maybe maybe I'm mistaken in this, I'm curious for y'all's thoughts, but I always think either matter or whatever the precursor was to matter is eternal or God is eternal and created everything. And those seem like the only two options. 
Is that how they see it? Do they believe that matter or whatever the precursor was is eternal? Or do they even go that far? Well, you're getting now to the Big Bang and theoretical <laughs> physics, which is not, that's not my area of expertise. I don't why know. not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really understand theoretical physics. Right. <laughs> you didn't read up on this last night? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is interesting it, to consider the fact that, like, we're expecting life to come from nothing. We are not. They are. And then beyond that, they still have to have the matter coming from nothing. It's again, it's like it becomes just increasingly impossible is what it sounds like to me. The mm -hmm. um, thoughts on that? Just, just <laughs> a, agreement. Just agreement. Lots, agreement. lots of agreement. Lots and lots of agreement. Yeah. Well, how do we talk to people about this? So let's say we've got a friend, a relative, someone like that that believes in specifically abiogenesis um, or even they might believe it without realizing they believe it because they're trying to block God out of the picture. How do we approach that with them? Because obviously it has to be a work of the Lord to truly show someone the truth. But there are also intelligent arguments that we can present in a kind and gracious manner. How would you or how have you approached that with someone who believes these things um, just in a humble way? How have you found that to be helpful? I wrote a book on it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right, there's your answer. Everybody <laughs> go write right videos too. Yeah. But that is really challenging because you're fighting against the media and what what the world sees as expert scientists mm -hmm. who write papers that say, you know, self-replicating molecule, and that'll be on the paper. Um, it's pretty hard to get them to even listen to you at that point because they've already made up their mind. Mm -hmm. But if you can actually start to talk about the science and, and issues we've discussed here today, I often start with the chirality thing because mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of easier to understand. Right. And it kind of blows people's minds that a natural process produces this, but life is only that. Mm -hmm. So how, do you, how are you going to do that? Um, that? That little things like that at least get them thinking. Mm -hmm. Just that that pebble in the shoe kind of mentality. I I also wonder. Maybe we look at, at Christians, uh, theistic evolutionists, who may say evolution occurs. They believe that evolution occurs, and God created that initial spark of life or whatever. What would you say to someone who uh, believes that God just created that initial spark of life and then evolution occurred? Because uh, to me, like, that is kind of a middle ground. Like, if you believe it, at that point, it's no longer abiogenesis, right? You're past we, that. You're past abiogenesis. Okay. Uh, but it's still wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could do multiple episodes of the show on that topic alone. Yeah. How, do you, how do you deal with theistic evolution? beyond that. And, and I think everything this organization does is kind of trying to Try to, trying to combat that. that. Yeah. What would you say, Dr. Tompkins? Uh, you, you worked with, uh, you, you know, you've mentioned your time in, at the, the university. Uh, how would you, as a believer, have conversations with those kinds of people? Well, I would bring in, you know, the irreducible complexity component. So, in other words, you, you can't just have proteins, you can't just have DNA, you can't just have RNA, you just can't just have lipids or carbohydrates. Everything has to be put together all at once in a very structured um, manner, you know, with, with information basically governing the whole process. And so it's worse than what came first, the chicken or the egg, because you got a chicken, you got an egg, two different, mm -hmm. <laughs> two different entities. But but in the cell, you've got lots of different types of chemicals and classes and groups of chemicals, and they all have to be compartmentalized and put together in a very specific way to function. And so, I actually had a conversation with a Chinese graduate student uh, regarding this, and they were just mystified. You know, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's a that's a huge problem. So that's that's what I would do. Okay, and I think I think it kind of makes sense. You know, you think of the history of Aristotle's abiogenesis. It kind of makes sense when you don't know or don't understand how unique and complex and how many pieces there are. Well, just like they used to think flies came from me. Right. And then they realized, oh, it's way more complicated than right. that. And it, it is important to appreciate historically the perspective about life in those days. Even in like 1850, which isn't that long ago, uh, Ernst Haeckel 
described cells, single cells, as just a lump of slime. Mm. You know, they they didn't know the complexity. Of course, they didn't appreciate the complexity is in there. But if they really believed it's just a lump of slime, um, of course, that could kind of spontaneously happen. So their their bar was pretty low. But now we know what life is. Mm-hmm. It's it's grown exponentially. Um, so you could kind of forgive them back then because they didn't know so much. But today, mm-hmm. we know a lot about this. Mm-hmm. It is like you said, it's it's that like backing backing up what that belief is. And they have that stronghold of like the simplest thing came from nothing. But that's it because we know that all the rest of it. And they fill it in with imaginary proto, proto simpler, simpler proto yeah. stuff that used to exist. And the hope that just once, just once over billions of years, there was the right assembly of the right parts that started the process with proto-proto things, admitting that those proto things can't survive in our current environment. They see that, so that's sort of like impenetrable, right? Because that belief, it's all imaginary stuff, but you can't really penetrate that. Mm-hmm. It's just almost like storytelling. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah, and that makes it pretty hard to, pretty hard to attack that. Yeah. I I don't know. My my mind is kind of like why believe because science is supposed to be uh, or true science is repeatable, observable. And when you start having to pull in maybes or like this could have happened once before but it can't now but we're still going to build this entire idea of abiogenesis off of that because we have to at that point it's it's no longer science in my opinion and i'm not a scientist so maybe that opinion isn't worth much but uh, it's a weaker form of science i'd say but yeah but a big a big hidden agenda here that fits into this is this it goes under the fancy term methodological naturalism okay which is as a scientist when i i study heart failure and when i study heart failure and try to find solutions to it i don't first think um, God caused this person to have heart failure and I'm, you know, it's, it's, right. you take the naturalistic approach of there's a natural process that led to this heart failure and I'm going to try to intervene and make it better. So that's how science is supposed to be practiced is you assume natural first, right? Um, and that works well for diseases, drugs, heart failure. <laughs> You know, you, you, you assume the natural thing going on there. But when you look at origins, like how did life first begin, if you take that and say, well, we're only going to consider natural, only natural can be considered because I'm a scientist, um, you're actually blocking out the possible truth. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. implying a huge bias here to say only natural can be considered. And what's curious then, and this is real, a real problem with the logic, is that by only allowing, you're not even trying to answer the question anymore of how did life begin. You're saying, what is the best natural explanation for you're life? Narrowing down your options. You've already yeah. thrown out the option, yeah. which is a huge bias, and that shouldn't be allowed. Mm-hmm. But they consider that actually more scientific because I'm only going to consider natural things. And you're not actually seeking truth anymore because you've blocked out half the truth and you're only seeking this version of truth. Wow. I actually never considered that. That's. Thank you for that. That's that's good. It's, it's just incredible problem. to me that we know, obviously, there was an eyewitness there at the beginning of all life, and God told us how life started right there in his word. And everything that we see scientifically lines up with what God's word says, and we don't have to worry that that's going to get disproven. We don't have to continue changing how we think life began or all of that. And I just think it's amazing that we have such a wise and awesome and powerful creator that even the simplest level of life that we know, I suspect we'll keep discovering more and more complexities, but even the simplest form of life that we know right now is still too complicated for us to even understand, let alone replicate. And that just shows to me just the power and awesomeness of our creator. And it's just beautiful to get to see so many different aspects of the things that he's created and how it was designed by a mind so much more brilliant than ours. And it's just, it It absolutely puts me in awe. And I, I think I think science has to be approached with some humility too, mm. and like you just expressed, I, I appreciate that very much. Even this, even the simplest, simplest form of life that they dumb down. Um, I said it has 493 genes. There still are something like 80 of those genes 
they have no idea what they're doing. Wow. <laughs> but they're wow. essential. Yeah. You can't yeah. take it away, but I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> so there are certainly layers that we still just don't, don't understand, and it's right. fun to try to figure out what, what God has done there. Mm-hmm. So thinking futuristically, uh, moving into, uh, let's say, scientists continue to try to tackle this problem, what, in your opinion, because you don't know, uh, I've asked you a lot of, what do you think about this instead of uh, what do you know about this? You don't know what Aristotle was thinking. But uh, what do you expect, as scientists, what do you expect from the scientific community on this topic in the future? What are they going to continue to do? What do you think they're going to continue to find? How are they going to explain it? How are they going to explain it, et cetera? Whoever wants to go first. Because, <laughs> because people want to be atheists, and because they have to find a rational justification for that, or else they're insane, right? Or right. It, they will, they are driven, they have to be driven to come up with encouraging results. And so they'll continue to go into the lab in, in one little area of this huge problem of how do you start life. They'll try in that one little area and they find out, oh, if I mix this with this and under these heating conditions and this pH, I can get this one result. So they'll keep being isolated results that you can consider, some would consider encouraging. But failing to see the big picture, it doesn't actually contribute much to have this little isolated result under very specific conditions with human intelligence thrown into the mix. Guiding it, but yeah. you'll continue, I'm sad to say, you're, you're going to see that. It'll never stop. Okay. Dr. Tompkins? Well, the one thing that I'm seeing is that they're pushing the problem off on something else. So they claim now that, that uh, that the, the essential building blocks of life are now coming in on um, meteorites. And the aliens really did bring it. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, in other words, yeah, we can't we can't create these uh, these essential building blocks for life here on Earth through random processes. They're just coming in from outer space. Well, you're just pushing the problem off, and and uh, so you know this is why the, a lot of these origin of life studies are actually done. Uh, through people that work for NASA in the astrobiology fields. And so so NASA is busy looking at exoplanets where life might be possible, but the, you also have biologists working with NASA that are trying to figure out, you know, how do we solve this problem of, of first life? And they get lots of money and your tax dollars to do that, but <laughs> they don't seem to make much progress. <laughs> <laughs> to add a little to that, I mean, yes, there is. there are meteorites that have landed. One is famous one is the Murchison meteorite. And they were able to look in there and find some amino acids. And that's considered encouraging. That's all you're going to hear about in the literature. But if you dig deep into the literature, you'll see they actually found like thousands, millions of other organic components in that. There's, there's a whole variety, a, a, spa- a whole chemical space of all kinds of complicated stuff in there. But life is extremely selective in only 20 amino acids. Only five nucleotides are related to life. So all the rest of the muck that's in there is either toxic, meaning it interferes, it, it gets in the way, or it actually degrades what is needed for life. Mm-hmm. So you could never take what they found in there mm-hmm. and take steps toward life because it's just completely in this mess of junk. You won't read about that in the news. It's and kind of just a misdirection. Yeah. yeah, and that's what they found, but right. they won't admit that limitation. Wow. Right. So for our listeners and viewers, uh, do you have any final uh, just encouragements or maybe even like calls to action in regard to this? Maybe make them uh, consider how they're considering life? You know, by the uh, book. Yeah, by the book. Yeah, by, yeah. <laughs> by by Stairway to Life. Yeah. I just maybe just final remarks to say that the more we know about chemistry and physics and thermodynamics, and the more we know about even the simplest of life, I see an increasing gap every year. The gap is getting bigger and bigger of what what natural processes are capable of and what we have in life, mm-hmm. and the gap just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I hope that's encouraging. Yeah. To the listeners. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the origin of life is a great entry point in apologetics, and you know, to talk to people about the existence of a creator because it's it's so thoroughly uh, impossible by naturalistic uh, means. So, yeah, I see it as a great apologetic point to dive into talking to an atheist or an agnostic. Just don't. Uh 
just, just do beat, your homework first. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> just do your homework and don't beat your head against someone who doesn't, who's right. already made up their mind. Right. You know? Uh, well, thank y'all so much, uh, for having this conversation with us. Uh, it's really been a, a pleasure to, to hear your unique perspective and, uh, to just learn more about how impossible <laughs> it all is or how impossible it, at the very least it seems, you know, uh, and they're going to continue to try to find it, to find that. Uh, but that chasm is growing, as you said. So thank you all much. so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for watching this episode of creation.live. Uh, we hope that you'll share this with your friends and family. Uh, if you have friends who struggle with this question, uh, you can send this their way. Uh, give us a like, a comment. Um, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're not listening on YouTube, you should. So thank you all so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time on creation.live. We want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons. If you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.